of the four part series that Bob has been presenting to us, The Art of America. This is part four, America, Boom and Bust. So we've already shared some of the Zoom technicalities that we wanna remind you of. Um, and let's, let's also just keep in mind that the Art Society is here to encourage people to um, support those that love art, love creating art. And so this, this is a safe zone where everybody obviously is respectful and appreciative of one another. So, and appreciative that Bob is giving of his time to share with us his knowledge. And this is part four. So we're gonna roll into that in just a minute. Uh, the Art Society, just a couple of little comments. We're about, we're about 250 members. We serve Madison and the surrounding area. We are a very active art society to allow artists to come together, encourage each other, inspire, educate, and please consider becoming a member for $25. If you enjoy what we've been doing, then we would really appreciate that. And you will be able to partake in future events along with the Zooms that we've been doing. Uh, we just had a beautiful member show that had to be online, but it, it was a very nice show. Um, I will tell you a little bit more about some upcoming Madison Art Society events toward the end and just keep in mind that we do have a website, madisonartsocietyct.org. That's where you can see what we do and perhaps become a member. So why don't I now introduce Bob, our speaker. And I will let Bob tell you what the lecture is about, the part four, boom and bust. So I will read Bob's um, credentials to you so you know who, how lucky we are to have Bob here with us today. So Bob is a graduate of Syracuse University School of Visual and Performing Arts. He spent his early career as an art director at Scholastic Magazines, Time Warner and National Geographic. Over the past decade, he helped create an arts therapy program for Save the Children, was a corporate development officer for the National Gallery of Art, headed marketing for Mystic Seaport and is a docent at the Yale Center for British Art. And his wife, Jean, who is a master watercolorist and teacher, live in Old Lyme, Connecticut. So Bob, we will hand it over to you now and we will listen with great interest. Well, thank, thanks, Hillary, and good morning, everyone. It's nice to be back with all of you again for our last lecture on the art of America. And I do want to thank the Madison Art Society for for hosting this series. And I hope you all have enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed sharing it with you. So now we will click the share screen button. We will click the uh, correct PowerPoint. <laughs> and voila, voila. All right. And let's see if I can just move that up here. Good, good. So here we are today stepping squarely into the 20th century as the United States steps onto the world stage leading up to World War I and what follows in the Roaring Twenties and the Great Depression. Today's lecture is called America Boom and Bust. And it will be a time when a new American realism in art is born. Artists like Reginald Marsh, Edward Hopper, and George Bellows will show us an urban world of new immigrants, high times, and lonely isolation. Thomas Hart Benton and Grant Wood will paint rural America. And photographer Dorothea Lange documents the devastation of the Great Depression and Dust Bowl migrants. Struggling West in a desperate quest for survival. 
in the early 20th century, the works of George Bellows would have a profound impact on American art. Discarding American Prussianism that we saw last month in favor of what would be a new American realism. He was born in 1882 in Columbus, Ohio, but died young at the age of 43. He would be the poet of New York realism painting. George Bellows would examine in many of his paintings the world of immigrants on the Lower East Side of New York in the first decades of the 20th century. Immigrants like these arriving at Ellis Island in 1911. And in the streets of the Lower East Side. Francis Ford Coppola would brilliantly recreate the world of Lower East Side New York in his Godfather II film and the young Michael Corleone. George Bellows gives us his own panoramic view of this world in his painting, The Cliff Dwellers from 1913. He shows us life in the Lower East Side tenements of New York from the tenement balconies to the streets filled with people, push carts, families, and above it all, clotheslines strung between buildings and laundry flapping in the wind like child Hassam's flags on Fifth Avenue. In the middle of it all, a mother in a white dress is scolding her barefoot child in the lower center of the painting. Few artists would capture the raw gritty energy of turn of the century New York City better than George Bellows. New immigrants gave America an abundance of cheap labor, especially children. The photographer Lewis Hines showed the world of immigrant children like this young girl and boys working at industrial spinning looms. Their small hands were ideal for changing the spinning spools of thread. Lewis Hines also showed us these young boys covered in Pennsylvania coal dust. Photographs like these would help motivate the creation of laws banning child labor. George Bellows' portrait of Patty Flanagan, done in 1908, could be one of those child laborers. His face and arms are brown from the sun, his nose sunburned, while his skinny bony chest is ghostly white. The boy's hands are already gnarled like a grown man from hard work, yet his expression is proud and defiant. This is the face of countless Irish immigrant children. The way Bellows paints his raw angular arms and chest reminds me of this painting we looked at, painting by Thomas Aikens of Wrestlers a painting we saw a few lectures ago. Among his most well-known works are Bellow's paintings of boxers, the same raw-boned flesh we saw in the portrait of the young Patty Flanagan is on display here. In fact, this could be Patty Flanagan, all grown up, using his hands not to push carts and lay bricks to pound and pummel and knock out his opponent in the ring. 
The painting is entitled Dempsey and Furpo. And it captures a pivotal moment in the September 14th, 1923 prize fight between American heavyweight champion Jack Dempsey and his Argentine rival, Luis Angel Firpo. The frenzy lasted less than four minutes, Firpo going to the floor nine times and Dempsey twice. What a slugfest. Although Jack Dempsey was the eventual winner of the fight, Bellows chose to represent the dramatic moment when Firpo knocked Dempsey out of the ring with a tremendous blow to the jaw. Bellows was on assignment for the New York Evening Journal and portrays himself as the balding man at the extreme left of the lower picture. The painting is so dramatic, not just the action of Dempsey being knocked out of the ring, but the low vantage point looking up at this spectacle. And we're among the spectators pushing Dempsey back into the ring. In Bellow's painting of the lone tenement beside the East River painted in 1909, he combines the lush painterly aesthetics of rich color and expressive light of impressionism, but in a new American realism that depicts a cold winter city and its cast off residence. George Bellows was a poet of the city, an artist who loved New York as much as Monet loved his gardens, or Bierstadt loved the American Rocky Mountains. I think this is an absolutely beautiful painting, the artist's mastery of capturing light, the pale pink and gray sky in the distance, the blue-gray foreground, and the monolithic abandoned tenement commanding the center. The huddled group of people in the lower left standing around a smoky fire. They help give us a sense of scale. Finding this kind of pictorial beauty in what most of us would have seen as only a bleak winter's winter scene is what distinguishes, I think, a true artist and visionary. His painting, Blue Morning, sees beauty in destruction and recreation and depicts the construction site of the Pennsylvania Station Railroad Terminal in New York City the old Penn Station, which was completed in 1910. It was an enormously ambitious project that helped transform New York into a thriving modern commuter metropolis. Bellows frames the scene with the iron pillars and overhang and shadow. A cloud of steam in the center foreground leads our eye up to the blue haze of morning light that reveals the partially constructed Penn Station. The site covered eight acres and required tearing down more than 500 buildings on two city blocks, displacing thousands of residents from what was a largely African-American community and what was once known as the Tenderloin District in Manhattan. Years before Reginald Marsh paints Coney Island, Life at the Beach Bellows depicts a day at the seashore in Beach at Coney Island. Shirtless boys, a passionate couple, and girls in white bathing dress attire. One leading critic at the time described Bellow's painting as, quote, a distinctly vulgar scene, probably because of the amorous couple shown embracing in the lower left of the painting. In 
His painting of a swarm of boys swimming off a New York wooden pier in 1915 is a masterpiece of figurative and maritime art. As we see a tugboat steaming by and a sailboat on the horizon. If you remember, boys swimming was the subject of Thomas Aiken's painting. We looked at which for all of its classical Greek idyllic beauty sparked considerable controversy in 1884 when it was painted for its depiction of old and young male nudes. Bale, in Bellow's swarm of swimming boys, we see echoes of Aiken's painting, particularly in the group of boys in the lower left of the painting. One element of the painting I have always found to be eerie is the two wooden pilings looming in the background, in the center of the painting. They remind me of the World Trade Center. Edward Hopper was born in Upper Nyack, New York in 1882. In high school, he dreamed of being a naval architect, but after graduation, he decided to pursue an art career. Born in the late Victorian era with a strict Baptist upbringing, Edward Hopper had issues with women. Even though he stood six feet, four inches tall and was considered by most a strapping, handsome fellow. He was, as one friend said, as timid as an English schoolboy. The artist and his teacher, Robert Henry, would encourage him to, quote, forget about art and paint pictures of what interests you in life. Not bad advice for all artists. What seems to have interested Edward Hopper most is painting loneliness, but above all, painting light. Like this empty road, an isolated gas station in the middle of nowhere. The light in this painting both natural and artificial, is brilliantly painted. The light on the gas pumps, the sign, illumination from the windows casting light on the pavement, and the fading shadows and dimming light of dusk in the background. They frame the lonely station attendant at his pump and give the scene an underlying mood of mystery even menace. There's not a car in sight. But if one did stop, it looks like this would be the place where you would stop and ask for directions to the Bates Motel. His 1930 painting entitled Early Sunday Morning is one of his most well-known works. It shows an empty street scene and sharp sidelight with a fire hydrant and a barber pole as stand-ins for human figures. To some viewers, it's a quaint street from bygone days. Meredith Wilson's The Music Man could be marching by at any minute on the back lot of MGM. But for others, it's a painting of loneliness, an abandoned town. Originally, Hopper intended to put figures in the upstairs windows, but left them empty, which adds to the mystery of why are the streets so deserted? It's not hard to imagine that in one of those rooms sits a despondent man on the edge of a bed next to an open window, staring at the pane of light on the floor Behind him, a woman, half-dressed in a pink slip, 
lies curled with her back turned to us. Hopper titled this painting, Excursion into Philosophy. The open book on the bed is a copy of Plato. Hopper's wife, Josephine, who everyone called Joe, is the model for the woman lying on the bed. She wrote about the painting that she thought it was, quote, rather scandalous, and he won't let people around here see it. I said a nice girl wouldn't have the soles of her feet so grimy. And Hopper replied, I'm not sure she is a nice girl. Joe was the model for the painting Morning Light, posing in a similar room in the same pink slip. The painting is in the collection of the Columbus Museum of Art. And Melissa Wolf, the museum's curator of American art, had this to say about the painting. Hopper's wife, Jo, insisted after they were married in the 1920s that she be his only model. She was 69 when she posed for Morning Sun. She's thoughtful as she looks out that painted window at buildings across the way. When I look at this for a long time, I always imagine that the implication is that there is someone just like her sitting sort of in this atomized bare room, looking out of every single one of those other windows too. Maybe Sunday morning is about isolation in cities. Everyone in her or his own world. People always think Hopper, a solitary quiet man is painting loneliness. Hopper himself said, the loneliness thing is overrated. In this regard, Morning Sun may really be about solitude, not loneliness. Edward Hopper married artist Josephine the Vision when he was past 40, and she would give him a new impulse to his paintings. For 43 years, Joe and Edward lived out a love-hate relationship that was passionate, at times violent, and deeply divided by their temperaments. Edward was dour, repressed, taciturn. Gee, he doesn't look like that at all in this picture. While Joe was outgoing and vivacious, throughout their marriage, she kept an intimate journal of their lives together. She was not only his sole model, but sometimes agent, social secretary, and record keeper. In her journal, using a pencil, she would make a sketch drawing of each of his paintings, along with a precise description of certain technical details. To me, Hopper is sometimes like the voyeur Jimmy Stewart in Alfred Hitchcock's Rear Window. Jimmy Stewart plays a photographer confined to his wheelchair with a broken leg and a cast. He entertains himself looking through the camera eye spy on other people in the windows of the apartment behind him. He becomes obsessed with what's going on in the apartment across from his, ultimately suspecting a murder has taken place. He sends his girlfriend, Grace Kelly, into the apartment to retrieve evidence. My wife, Jean, and I lived in the back third floor studio of a brownstone on West 76th Street when we first came to New York City in the early 1970s. And like anyone who has lived in a similar apartment, you soon discover there's a whole separate world that exists behind and between apartments, a world hidden from the street. In this painting, Night Window, done in 1928, Hopper gives a partial glimpse of a half-dressed woman seen through the center window. Her figure is lit from the apartment light within. A breeze rustles the curtain in the open window on the left. 
Possibly it's a warm evening, a hot New York summer night in New York City with open windows long before air conditioning. But I do think it's hard to decide what we should think about a painting like this, especially if you're a woman. In the history of male artists and the male gaze, as masterfully as Hopper composes the painting, especially the detail of the window curtain blowing and paints the dramatic contrast of interior light and the external darkness of night, the viewer may reasonably feel a little guilty about this peeping Tom art. Patty Junker, who is the curator of American art at the Seattle Art Museum, where she oversaw an exhibition of Hopper's women paintings, she noted this, quote, there is no escaping the voyeuristic gaze of the artist who catches his subjects at moments when they think no one else is watching them. In his painting, New York in 1939, Hopper again puts us in the dark not watching the movie, but the blonde theater usherette on the right. It's a remarkable demonstration of the artist's technique and composition and painting, a range of light and shadow from the black and white movie on the screen to the darkened theater with its lush red velvet seats to the hallway light on the right that illuminates the standing woman. Like its other paintings, it also has a mysterious visual narrative. Others in the theater watch the film, but we're sitting at the back of the house, unseen observers, watching the woman. She rests her chin on her hand and looks to be in deep private thoughts, ignoring a movie she's seen a hundred times. Now, if the painting were a movie, you would be wondering who is in the back of the theater in the dark, looking at the woman and not at the movie. And what is this person thinking? And what happens next if this were a movie? Patty Junker also noted about this painting, quote, the, the one certainty is that she is an object of desire to someone she doesn't see. Her blonde hair glints in the soft light framing, framing her in a red curtain. And, and next to her hangs suggestively parted. <clears throat> Much like all the blonde actresses that Alfred Hitchcock had in his movies. Nighthawks was done in 1942. <clears throat> Sip of water. Excuse me. <clears throat> and Nighthawks is probably the best known of Hopper's paintings. The inspiration for the picture may have come from Ernest Hemingway's short story, The Killers, which Hopper greatly admired. Hopper said Nighthawks has more to do with the possibility of predators in the night than with loneliness. On a lonely deserted urban street, a group of customers sitting at the counter of an all night diner. The shapes and diagonals are carefully constructed. The viewpoint is cinematic from the sidewalk as if the viewer were approaching the diner with its large glass windows. The harsh interior light reveals each person in stark contrast to the dark night outside. As in many Hopper paintings, the intersection and interaction between people is minimal, which lets the viewer make their own assumptions on who they are and why are they there in a lonely diner in the middle of a lonely street in the middle of a night. 
Hopper didn't like talking about meaning in his paintings. He would complain to critics and public alike, quote, the whole answer is there on canvas. I don't know how I could explain it any further. The scene was supposedly inspired by a diner that's since been demolished in Greenwich Village, which was Hopper's neighborhood in Manhattan. His wife, Joe, kept meticulous details of all of Hopper's paintings and wrote in her journal these detailed notes about the painting, which allows us a, a great exercise in close observation. These are her notes. Night plus brilliant interior of cheap restaurant, bright items, cherry wood counter, plus tops of surrounding stools, light on metal tanks at rear right, brilliant streak of jade green tiles, three quarters across canvas, at base of glass of window, curvy at corner, light walls, dull yellow ochre door into kitchen right, very good looking blonde boy in white coat and cap inside counter, girl in red blouse, brown hair, eating sandwich, man, nighthawk, beak, in dark suit, steel gray hat, black band, blue shirt, clean, holding a cigarette, other figure, dark, sinister, back at left, light sidewalk outside, pale greenish, darkish red brick house opposite. Ed posed for the two men in a mirror and I for the girl. He was about a month and a half working on it. And with all the movie references today and for you movie buffs, Nighthawks also influenced the look of the 1982 sci-fi classic Blade Runner. Director Ridley Scott said, quote, I was constantly waving a reproduction of this painting of Hopper's Nighthawks under the noses of the production team to illustrate the look and mood I was after. So if Edward Hopper painted worlds of urban isolation and lonely people, Reginald Marsh was just the opposite. He celebrated life in the city in all its garish, gaudy glamor during the 1920s and 1930s. Reginald Marsh was born in Paris to artist parents who had moved to Nutley, New Jersey. He went to Lawrenceville Prep School which was and remains the arch rival of the Hill School where I went. He studied art at Yale and after graduation went to New York City to become an illustrator. In New York, he would become the Hogarth of Coney Island and he would also discover the best show is the people themselves. Where Hopper saw city life as the lonely isolation of the human spirit, Reginald Marsh embraces the bright lights and crowds, exuberantly capturing all the neon glitter, carnival rides, burlesque houses, and cheap glamor. And nowhere in New York captured all of this better than on the beaches and boardwalk of Coney Island. Now, while the rich summered in Newport, the Vineyard and the Hamptons, the rest of New York, especially its now firmly established immigrant population swarmed the Coney Island beaches and all of its theme park sideshows. It was all there for just a nickel subway ride and 20 cents a movie. Reginald Marsh said, quote, I like to go to Coney Island because of the sea, the open air, and the crowds, crowds of people in all direction. 
in all positions, without clothing, moving, like the great compositions of Michelangelo and Van Dyke. You can certainly see what he's referring to when he mentions Van Dyke and the influence of Anthony Van Dyke. Just look at the Baroque master's painting of Samson and Delilah from 1630 and compare the composition, the swirling mass of bodies and exposed flesh to Marsh's painting entitled Coney Island Scene, which was done in 1932. George Bellows painted the scene 24 years earlier. In Marsh's Coney Island world, men and women are both spectators and performers. They're obsessed with the fantasy and glamor of Hollywood movies. And just the sheer thrill of being alive, spinning around at Steeplechase Park on this mad merry-go-round of life. Missouri-born artist Thomas Hart Bitten, in his paintings, and especially murals like this, showed that there were high times in the Midwest too, and celebrates the dance halls and juke joints of Kansas City with the same vibrant energy as Reginald Marsh celebrated Coney Island. Looking at Bitten's swirling figures from jazz age dancers, to acrobats and movie theaters to malt shops is like a fever dream of Norman Rockwell's America. He was named after his great uncle, Thomas Hart Benton, one of the first two United States senators elected from Missouri. He spent much of his youth between Missouri and Washington, DC but he would rebel against his father who was also a congressman who wanted him to become a politician too. And with his mother's emotional and financial support, he studied art at the Art Institute of Chicago followed by a trip to Paris, then moved to New York City. But Benton would declare himself an enemy of modernism and in turn would be rejected by the New York art establishment for his folksy scenes. I mean, where were the huddled masses, tenement buildings, and this new thing called abstract art? Benton would reject it all, leave New York and retreat back to Kansas City. Benton grew up on folk and country music and was a musician himself. In 1973, when he was 82 years old, he was lured out of retirement by Tex Ritter to paint a mural for the Country Music Hall of Fame Museum in Nashville, Tennessee. Benton came up with the concept for his mural while sipping Jack Daniels with Tex Ritter. He wanted to show the roots of music before there were records and stars. He completed the mural in 1975 and died at his easel before he could sign his last painting. The artist Grant Wood was born in 1891 in rural Iowa and grew up in Cedar Rapids. After high school, he enrolled at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and studied Impressionism and Post-Impressionism on trips to Europe in the 1920s. He would be known for his lyrical realism of the Midwest 
Surprisingly, it was the work of the 15th century Flemish artist, Jeanne van Eyck, and this wedding portrait of a husband and new bride from 1434 that influenced him to take on the same clarity of this technique and to incorporate it in his own paintings. Grant Wood responded to the realism in this painting with its figurative detail, such as gesture, clothing, setting, lighting, and visual narrative. So it's not surprising to see this reflected in his most well-known painting, American Gothic, painted in 1930. It's as well-known as the Mona Lisa or Whistler's mother. Gertrude Stein assumed the painting was meant to be a satire of repression and narrow-mindedness of rural, small-town American life. Wood's inspiration came from the town of Eldon, in southern Iowa, where a cottage designed in the Gothic Revival style, with an upper window in the shape of a medieval pointed arch, provided the background and also the painting's title, American Gothic. This painting would make him an overnight sensation when the painting was first exhibited at the Art Institute of Chicago. Wood decided to paint the house along with, as he was quoted to say, the kind of people I fancied should live in that house. The couple are in the traditional roles of men and women. The man's overalls and pitchfork symbolize honest, hardworking Midwestern. The actual models for this iconic painting were his sister, Nan Wood Graham, and his dentist, Byron McKeeby, both posing in a photograph from the early 1940s, standing next to this iconic painting. Looking at this photograph, I, I wonder if the dentist ever changed his expression. And he also looks so much like my dentist when I was a young boy in St. Joseph, Missouri. But the paintings by Grant Wood that appeal to me most are his Midwestern landscapes, maybe because I am from the Midwest. Just as Thomas Moran mythologized and idealized the West in his landscape paintings that we looked at when we studied the art of the West, So too does Grant Wood in presenting his own visual poetry in the farmlands and small towns of his rural world. Wood is floating above these landscapes, unbound, free. They are kind of magic realism of rolling farmlands through the seasons. Newly plowed for spring planting, a glow in verdant green, a furrowed rose of summer, the fall harvest. And teepees of snow laden corn shocks in the winter where the only sign of life are the footprints of a rabbit. Wood's composition teems with abstract design, most notably through the rhythmically geometric array of cone shapes that seem to recede infinitely into the distance. Here we again hover in the air like a drone observing a family planting a tree in honor of Arbor Day. Do people still do this on Arbor Day? Is Arbor Day even still celebrated? A 
Grant Wood was a conflicted man who lived a life that didn't easily conform to the social and cultural norms of rural Iowa. He was born in 1891 on a farm some 30 miles from Cedar Rapids. He would die of cancer two days before his 50th birthday. He married when he was in his 40s for a brief disastrous union that left him broke and increased his drinking. Some art historians believe Grant Wood was gay, but that remains a question. His portrait of Arnold Pyle, his studio assistant and a possible love interest, is a portrait of one of those reserved Midwesterners that populate Grant Wood's figurative works. In the lower right background, nude males are seen bathing along a river against an idyllic setting we see in so many of Wood's other paintings. There is a suggestion of sexuality and the coming of age of a man as the title conveys. In tribute to the 21st birthday of Arnold Pyle, his studio assistant, Grant Wood painted this river of life portrait. Here Wood depicts Pyle standing resolutely between symbols of youth and manhood, spring and autumn. He also includes a small butterfly on the left on the verge of alighting on Pyle's sleeve to further suggest the younger man's ongoing metamorphosis. Just as the photography of Lewis Hine brought about public awareness of the plight of child labor in the early decades of the 20th century, one photograph would define the Great Depression of the 1930s. A photograph of a migrant mother taken in 1936 by Dorothea Lange. The photographer Dorothea Lang was a San Francisco society photographer, but her photographs of the people of the Dust Bowl years of the 1930s would document the faces of the Great Depression. Here we see her sitting atop her woody station wagon with her large format black and white camera. She is also wearing some very cool tennis shoes that I'm surprised Nike hasn't taken note of yet. She would use her camera, the camera's eye and the photographer's skill to record the devastation of the depression on the people most affected. Midwestern farmers fleeing the Dust Bowl and their farms drought stricken and foreclosed on by the banks. Midwesterners, farmers, Americans struggling westward to California to find work as migrant laborers. They were fleeing the Dust Bowl for 100 million acres of the Midwest and the Southern Plains were turning into a wasteland of sand and dust. Large sections of five states were affected, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Colorado, and New Mexico. Climate and poor farming practices that stripped the soil were the cause. As a photographer for the FSA, the Farm Security Administration, Dorothea Lang would take one of the most iconic photos of the Great Depression, this worried mother and her children, photographed at a migrant camp 
1936 in Napomo, California. The woman was part of a camp of pea-picking migrants where the night before there had been a freeze and crops were ruined for picking that day. Now, Dorothea Lyon got this photo, considered one of the greatest in the history of photography, is a story in itself of the art of documentary photography. After a long day of shooting, Dorothea was driving home miles away from this scene before she decided to turn around. Instinct told her there may be one more good photograph. When she arrived back at the camp, she sees a mother and her children in a makeshift tent and knows there's a photo there to tell a story. Her first photograph shows the family, but the older teenage daughter on the left might suggest to the viewing public a lack of family planning compared to the younger children with their mother on the right. And this older teenage daughter could create concerns back at the home office of her bosses at the Farm Security Agency. These photographs were meant to raise public awareness and government funding for starving American farmers. So in her second photo, she shows the mother nursing her child in a Madonna-like pose. But the mother is clearly uncomfortable and Lang feels a nursing mother might also be too much for the general public. So she restages the photograph and adds another child and creates what by every measure would be a very successful photo, a migrant mother caring for her children. But Dorothy Lang thought the photograph could still be better. A lesser photography and a lesser photographer would have milked the cute child. But Dorothy Lang returns two children to the photo and has them turn their faces away from the camera. She has the mother rest her face on her hand, her arm and hand drawing our eye to her face where everything about the woman's worry and humanity is captured. When I look at this photo of a migrant mother and children, I can't help but think about all the migrant mothers and their children today at our Southern borders. And I hope there's a Dorothea Lang photographing their lives and reminding us of our common humanity. Dorothea Lang described the art of photography this way. Photography takes an instant out of time, altering life by holding it still. That concludes today's art lecture and I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you enjoyed this series on the art of America as much as I have sharing with you some of my favorite art and artists. I know we covered a lot of art history and we saw the works of artists who not only changed art, but showed us a changing nation through some of its most turbulent decades. Each artist has given us a unique perspective on America and its people. And now I welcome any comments or questions you might have on the series and today's last lecture. And I will stop screen share and we can see your lovely faces. So please use your chat feature. 
uh, your raise hand feature and let us know if you have any questions for Bob. This is now's the time. Last chance. Yes, for this series. We'll tell you about future Bob events after. Bob, thank you so much for doing this. You've been terrific. Marianne, did you have any favorites that you saw today or during um, the series? Well, I was going to ask you about the uh, butterfly on Arnold, uh, Arnold coming comes of age. And then you, you answered my question before I could answer it. Yeah, just a, a, a little detail in close observation that uh, I must admit, I, I missed that detail about the first 10 times I, I looked at uh, that uh, painting, but I was reading a critic's uh, description of it and it did okay. point it out. I thought uh, it had something to do with spring and fall because there's a, like a fall leaf right next to it. Yeah. But I, so yeah. thank you for that, that explanation. Oh, you're welcome. And I also like the Grant Wood uh, primitive, you didn't call them primitive paintings though, but to me, that's what they look like of the Midwest. Yeah, I, those, those, as I said, are my, are, are my favorites. Here, we can pull those guys up for a second. Hang on, since you mentioned that, let's go find it. Here we go. Oops. Hang on. This, this will definitely make everyone a little dizzy as we scroll through here. There we go. Um, yeah, I. Uh, whoops, I didn't do it, did it? Oh, well. Hang on. It's supposed to work better than that. Let me pull that up since Marianne was so nice to point that out. And let's see if we can't get it. There we go. <clears throat> yeah, I think um, just everything about these uh, Midwestern aerial view landscapes is just just a life. I sort of first think about, so how do you find that viewpoint? Mm. You know, how did he kind of come upon that as a way to really take us above? You know, people think of the Midwest as being so flat. It's really not. We've got some hills out there. But the design, the um, uh, detail, uh, the meticulous details uh, of all of this information. And it is a kind of idyllic view for sure. Um, this one in particular, uh, I just find quite wonderful with the little detail of the uh, rabbit print. So yeah, quite, uh, quite fun. Other, other people in the audience, did you have some favorites today or as we went through so much art history. Now that I've mastered, I hope going back and finding any of your paintings today that you might have liked. Were there any artists that you weren't familiar with or, or artwork that you weren't familiar with? Anyone that you were pleased to discover or see more of their work? I have a comment, if I may. Sure. Um, uh, the George Bellows painting, the Dempsey and Furpo. I mean, many of these artists I, I was not familiar with at all. So thank you. You um, <laughs> filled in the gap for me where I, didn't, I never took an art appreciation course in college or an art history course. So I missed that. You know, a lot of fellow students did that during university time and I did not do that. I was a foreign language major and that was my focus. So this is really filling in hundreds of years of a lack of knowledge. So I appreciate it greatly. And we're never too old to, to keep learning, that's for sure. So the Dempsey and Furpo, I'm just curious, did, did Dempsey have a problem with that painting? Since he won the fight and had many more knockouts than Firpo, what happened there? <laughs> So I guess the question might be, did uh, Dempsey uh, take a, a swing at Bellows at some time in, in the future? That's a good question. I, 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 don't, I don't know. And that's part of the fun in putting these together because they're paintings that I know a little about, but as I do a little 
bit more research, I actually had to ask my quest, myself the question, so which one is Dempsey and which one is FERPO? I didn't hey. know that. So I had to uh, do some more research and I found that wonderful kind of blow by blow account <laughs> that it's Dempsey knocked out of the ring. I mean, uh, and then, you know, seeing the people kind of put, catching him and pushing him back in and Bellows puts himself in the painting as many artists might and have during the centuries. And he's over there on the left. So I thought, yeah, that's such a, uh, such a well-known painting, but didn't know the round lasted for only about four minutes. So yeah, great, great, uh, uh, great painting. And, and I think also, uh, what I like so much about Bellows uh, and Robert Henry, if you look at his works as well, you can see the influence of Robert Henry on Bellows. I particularly love this painting of uh, Patty Flanagan. Oh, me too. Uh, and it is really, really something. Uh, and I think also just kind of looking at the Cliff Dwellers, the title of it, the Cliff Dwellers. This whole idea of this world from the street side, from behind buildings, this whole urban architecture that Hopper is painting, that Bellows is painting, this architecture that Grant Wood is painting, how much architecture in the early 20th century plays a role in, in these paintings, these narratives of, of you know, life, not only in New York, but you know, life out in, in the Midwest. Um, and I think, again, it's a part, uh, it's such a critical part, of course, of our, of our American experience, of the foundation of history, of our culture, of our society, this, this land of immigrants, this melting pot with, without that, of course, what we wouldn't have America as we know it. Um, and so it's, uh, again, uh, looking at the photographs by Lewis Hines, again, uh, and thinking about how Coppola recreates the Lower East Side and Godfather II, which is quite remarkable and wonderful to watch. But, you know, the, the, the Lewis Hines photographs of arriving immigrants for many of us our arriving answers on Ellis Island. So yeah, this, this, this story and artists and painters, uh, particularly like Bellows and Reginald Marsh, painting that world. Uh, artists who didn't, weren't born in New York City, <laughs> you know, uh, who Bob, arrived there. Yeah. Bob, there's a question from yes. Diane Podrat and she wants to know, did Dorothea Lang pay her subjects? Uh, that's a really good question. And hang on, let's go to that great photograph. Um, let's go down and look at that one. There we go. Let's get that. Let's, where are you? Hold on. Boom. Um, not to my knowledge. It's a very good question. However, this photograph as we just saw, was not just an instant, uh, in the moment uh, photograph. It was carefully constructed and orchestrated. So it's not to discredit, of course, in any manner. It's documentary photography. And she knew what would make a good photograph. And it is a great photograph. It's iconic. But years later, the woman herself, who was of Cherokee descent uh, was uh, um, made protest. She felt as if she had never been credited fairly as being the subject mm. of the photograph. And if you all do some kind of research and you should, you know, any of these photographs or paintings, you know, go, go do a little research online. And I learned this while I was just looking at this photograph. And uh, it was something that she felt uh, she had never really been uh, properly acknowledged as the subject of the photograph. She is just the universal e ubiquitous migrant mother. 
So it's an interesting way, I think, and an important way. Who, who, who is this woman other than who she represented? Who were the pea pickers uh, in Napoma, California at the time? The story of how Dorothea Lang turns around and goes back and gets this photograph. But uh, really not uh, until years later, more conversational, but who is she? But to answer the question, no, I don't know that these people were uh, compensated. The photograph did result in thousands of, of pounds of food being sent out by the government to California to the migrant camp. And it became a photograph that was uh, reproduced uh, throughout America uh, as, as really the face of the depression. So one photograph did an enormous amount of, of, of uh, good and, and, and raised awareness. Good question. Any other questions? Let me, read, let me read some of these comments and then we'll, we'll grab some questions as well. So Beverly Shermeyer says, wonderful series of American art and artists, great job. Uh, Colleen and Zoni, many thanks, so well done. And then, yeah, the question about paying her subjects. Very inspiring, the, the hour flew by, so inspiring. That's from Joan's iPad. Thank you so much. I learned a great deal. Rosemary, I think Sarah Felipe and Donna uh, Favret, thanks so much. This was wonderful. Mary Horrigan, thanks so much. I wish we could do this every week. <laughs> so maybe we'll throw in any more questions and then we can read more comments after. Well, there's another question here from June. Is there a motive in the use of windows for Hopper? I'm sorry, say that question again while I pull that up. Is there a motif in the use of windows for Hopper? That's a, that's a really good question too, because just quickly as we look, and again, the idea that you know Hopper is the artist of loneliness, but he's the artist of light. And if we think about sources of light, just as in the gas station, you know, the light and all the sources of light and the windows, the design, the architecture of windows. This is a painting about windows. It's a painting about storefronts. It's a painting about all the shadows that we see being cast across the windows, on the window shades, the negative and the positive, the white curtains, the negative uh, shadows in the windows. Look at those blue shadows cast by the fire hydrant and the barber pole. So I, the, 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 the scene, uh, it's, this was actually a, a storefronts along 7th Avenue uh, during the depression, uh, you know, gave him an opportunity for a wonderful structure, a wonderful kind of diagram to paint color, light, shape. And it's good to pick that up on the windows of Hopper. That could be a, a lecture in and of itself. I mean, the window here is, is the source of light, but again, the architectural design and structure of the painting. And I talked about the window, the pane of light on the floor. I should have mentioned the pane of light on the left by the woman's legs. Again, the windows and painting the windows, the colors in the windows, the windows outside in the buildings across the street. <laughs> you know, mm. looking in windows, peeping in windows. <laughs> you know, in a way, uh, Hopper is kind of seeing the world again as, as, as this kind of, of, of voyeur who is framing life as he sees it through windows, seeing other people's lives. So yeah, windows. Good. So That's yeah, good. and the ultimate window, of course, is the window in the Night Hawks painting of the nighttime diner. And gee, that looks like the same street across the way, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And the painting we saw that was just the uh, Sunday morning street scene. So yeah, Hopper and windows. 
That was one of my questions, Bob, with Nighthawks. What size is that painting? Uh, mm. Good, good question. And I'm going to have to send you uh, to the Art Institute of Chicago's website or go to Wikipedia. Yeah, sure. No, no. <laughs> and they'll have that and they will have the dimensions on that. That's a very good, that's a very good question. It's one of the things I should have Don't kind worry. of noted Joe's wonderful detailed notations on the painting. Uh, and I, I, I imagine somewhere in those notations was the actual size of the painting. Mm. It was, mm -hmm. She, she was a meticulous curator of her husband's work. Mm -hmm. uh, some more comments. We have, uh, thanks so much. Yes, every week. Wish we could do this. Mary Horrigan and great job, Bob. The Grant Wood pieces were a revelation. Margaret Mann and Diane Podra. You bring such, such depth into looking at the paintings. You make me look at paintings in a different way. Oh, that's and a thanks, Bob. Compliment. Wonderful lectures. I've been to many great talks at the National Gallery. Your talks match the quality of those from Walter Welsh. Wow, that's high, high praise. Well, uh, I think the, the comment, if it makes us want to look more closely at paintings and take our time to look at paintings, uh, then, I, then, I'm very, then I'm very pleased. I just went into New York the weekend before last with my wife, G. We went to the Met to see Alice Neal. Retrospective, Alice Neal would have been so delighted. She was still alive, but the Met did a <laughs> retrospective of her work. And then down to the Morgan Library to see the drawings of David Hockney. But while at the Met, one of the real pleasures was seeing so many of the paintings that we've been looking at in this lecture series, <laughs> for real because it kind of speaks to Hillary's question. So how big is that painting? You know, uh, how big is Winslow Homer's uh, Snap the Whip? <laughs> how big is uh, 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 Winslow Homer's painting of the man stranded on the boat about to sink, surrounded by sharks? And I must be honest, I haven't been in the Met for years. And so to see these paintings first, uh, uh, hand to see sergeants, Madam X. <laughs> so, you know, that's a real, that's a real thrill. So there's nothing like seeing them for real. And uh, wherever possible, I tried to show them as large as I could on this series and tried to get the best resolution as I could, but uh, nothing like seeing them in real life. So next time, you all are out at the Art Institute of Chicago. <laughs> you know where to go first to look at uh, Hopper's Nighthawks. So thank you everyone for your, for your lovely comments and I'm glad you enjoyed the series. And I look forward to doing more in the future with the Madison Art, Art Society. They're a great organization and you all are a great audience. Thank you. Well, Bob, we really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much to you for yeah, like I said, giving us your time and sharing your knowledge with us. And hopefully we, many of us will head down to the, um, the Center for British Art right down the road and meet you when we can all go out and be in public more. And who knows, maybe that'll be an outing that the Art Society can organize and we can get down there and hear you in person in front of many live pieces of art. So that well, would be we, we are, we, we had our docent meeting and some of you docents uh, I know have been kind enough to sit in uh, and join me on these art lectures, but we've just been learning about plans for the Yale Center for British Art and some days will be open. So, you know, do check out uh, their, their website. I, I know the plan is to have some limited days of showing over the weekends uh, and designated hours and kind of designated size of groups coming, you know, in and out. So kind of check in on, on the website there and uh, yeah, it'd be great. And then when things kind of open up a little bit more, maybe it would be wonderful to get a whole group of, of Madison Art Society members to, to come down and uh, I would certainly enjoy sharing some of their masterworks uh, uh, with, with, with all of of you in, in, in the uh -huh. future. On that note, Bob, what's the amount of people that you can host as a docent? 
Well, when we were giving our tours live, uh, we yeah. get pretty big groups in there. So then we like have 15 people in a group. You know, if it got really large, then we would divide groups up with uh, the docents. So another one of the very, very talented and knowledgeable docents would mm -hmm. also be uh, there to give uh, give a tour. So, uh, you know, we, okay. can, we can accommodate uh, whatever size. We uh, ought to keep that in mind then for an outing that we plan. And of course it's free. And across the street is the Yale University Art Gallery. So two of the great museums in America are right there across from each other in uh, New Haven and then some great places to eat right around within a few steps away. So it's a great outing for mm -hmm. a day trip down there and parking Excellent. is uh, nearby in a couple of parking garages. Okay. You know, I, I, well and we'll get that all set up. I can inject a, a plug. The, the University Art Gallery is opening this Friday from three to seven and then on Saturday and Sunday, uh, it's time tickets you have to go time free tickets. Uh, I think it's 12 to 4 on Saturday and Sunday. The British Arts Center is going to open in similar hours, though 12 to 7 on Fridays, beginning June the 4th. There are no live tours planned um, for the foreseeable future, but they will yeah. be open, both of them. So. Oh, great. Thank you for that information. That's Thanks, great. Margaret. Margaret is one of our very talented, knowledgeable uh, docents. As you can tell, she has the dates and times. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, just one more little comment. Um, we have more thank yous from various people. So that's wonderful. And somebody, Sheila Creed, let everybody know that Nighthawks is 33 by 60 inches. Pretty Very big. Good. So that's great. Thank you. Inches. Thank you. I'm going to write that note down. Uh -huh. All right, good. Well, we're going to wrap up here. Um, so Bob, in, in the future, everybody, just to let you know, Bob will be back. Uh, next, are we talking next year? I guess we are yeah. February, right, Marianne? Um, yeah. With something in celebration of Black History Month. So art relating to that topic and Bob will present to us at that time. And in the meantime, I just, again, I wanna thank Bob and Marianne for everything you've done with these, putting these together, gathering our speakers, especially Bob Potter in this case. So wonderful job. And the other people that have helped uh, publicize this event, run this event, uh, Jennifer Corcoran with um, information out in the newspaper, Jen Thompson doing our technological side, website, other things behind the scenes. When we Zoom at times, Beverly, thank you for your Facebook contribution. Um, so yes, it's a team and it, it works. So for more information about the Madison Art Society and upcoming Zooms, please just, you can head to our website. Madison Art Society, ct.org. We do have some upcoming Zooms in June, so be sure to check those out. We have an art demo, and then we have some photography um, presentations on how to upload artwork more geared um, toward artists, toward our members. But um, please tune in. We hope to see you at the library on June 4th. The Scranton Shops fundraiser will be taking place at the library and the Madison Art Society will have a booth and you can get in to see the library. So very worth it to see the gorgeously renovated um, Scranton Library. And we will have a booth, some, some little pieces of art, maybe some cards, some prints and some small originals will be for sale as well. You can say hi to some artists over there and then a jury show in um, the summer. So check out all of that at the website and thank you everybody for joining us. Enjoy thank your you. Have a great summer, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.